Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. We're told the Syrian peace talks will proceed. At the same time, Vice President Joe Biden says the U.S. is ready to impose a military solution in Syria. According to this American official, a political settlement is not essential. With this kind of loose rhetoric, a U.S.-Russia conflict in Syria just became more likely. To crosstalk the Syrian conflict, I'm joined by my guest, Pepe Escobar in Paris. He's an independent political analyst and author. In Oxford, we have Dan Glazebrook. He is also an independent political analyst and author of the book, Divide and Ruin, The West's Imperial Strategy in the Age of Crisis. And in Tel Aviv, we cross to Philippe Asselin. He is an international relations expert. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, Dan, if I can go to you first in Oxford here, um, we know that the vice president uh, is very gaff prone. But he did say, uh, oddly, when he was in Turkey, that the U.S. could impose a military solution, that a, a political one is not essential. Um, what do you make of that? Because it, what's the whole point of these talks in, uh, uh, on Friday for to start the, uh, some kind of ceasefire and end this conflict in Syria? Go ahead. Well, the U.S. and, and Britain have consistently, since peaceful uh, negotiations have been raised way back in 2011, 2012, ever since it's been on the cards, the U.S. and Britain have gone out of their way to sabotage any prospect of, of them taking place. Now, the tactics have changed a little bit since the Russian intervention. The tactics have changed from saying that Assad must go as a precondition for talks to take place. They're now saying Assad must go as a precondition for the successful conclusion of any talks. All of this is a means of still the same kind of strategy strategy of trying to sabotage any peaceful settlement because what it is is a message to the is a message to the fighters keep fighting don't you don't have to compromise you don't have to agree to anything you don't really have to seriously negotiate mm -hmm. maybe just show up uh, and we will impose something we will we, we, we will impose something if needs be at the end it's a way of egging them on uh, and keeping the fighting going as a means of destabilizing Syria and I think it demonstrates that the US commitment to peaceful uh, uh, negotiations is clearly lacking okay Pepe one of the things that Biden was getting at is that uh, the U.S. could impose a military solution on Syria, meaning fighting uh, ISIL. But, you know, I, f I find it very hard to believe that they could just go in there and surgically take care of ISIL and then they'll withdraw and then, then they'll support a peace process. I think they would probably take the regime out of Dam uh, Damascus uh, <coughs> while doing the same thing. I I it's hard to believe they would do it otherwise. Go ahead. <laughs> Joe Biden, <laughs> please, Sorry. come on, it's ridiculous. Look, let's look at what's going on in the terrain. That's the most important thing. This uh, charade in Geneva is supposed to last, uh, and Stefan de Mistura himself, he already said that on the record, it's going to last at least for the ne next six months. It could last another year, two or three, because what really matters is what's going on in the ground uh, in this, uh, I would say, a why. There is a why in Syria. This is the Syria that matters. This is urban Syria in the west part of the country, industrialized, urban. And Damascus in the north, roughly uh, Homs and, uh, and uh, Hama in the middle, Latakia over here, and Aleppo in the north. So if you control this why, you control Syria. And this is what's happening since the, uh, the Russian intervention. Uh, the Russian Air Force, uh, the Syrian Arab Army, uh, the help from Hezbollah, which is essential, especially uh, Syria-Lebanon border, and those 2,000 uh, uh, Iranian uh, uh, special forces, including a lot of Afghans, by the way, they are making you know, very, very strong progress for the past three months. You don't read about this in Western corporate That's media. Right. Forget it. That's but right. facts on the ground are being altered. So if you don't control the desert, that's not a big deal. Uh, the only thing that matters in the desert is around Dar al Azor because of, of the, the, the oil wells. And they will be moving there eventually. But the most important thing is secure the why that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, help Syrian Kurds, which the Americans are also doing, to secure the border yep. with Turkey. And this is where Turkey and the U.S. are absolutely opposed, because Turkey wants to cut off the union of these uh, uh, Syrian Kurd cantons in the east and west near the Turkish border. 
and they cannot do it because the Syrian Kurds probably going to take over everything with help from the okay. Russians, with help from okay. Syria, and with help from the Americans. Let's, well. let's keep with the talks here. If I'm going to Philippe in Tel Aviv, uh, you know, um, both our uh, previous guests have uh, uh, brought up really good points. Is the facts on the ground keep changing now, and actually to the advantage of Assad and his allies here. And also, when you and I, I know when looking at the uh, meeting between Kerry and Lavrov here, you know, they were shaking hands and smiling, but they were talking. Talking about very different peace talks, I, I really ha I don't see how either side can really square that. They're looking at very different groups to sit down, and most people won't even show up. Go ahead in Tel Aviv. Um, Peter, I'm sorry to have to agree with you. Oh no! Um, I don't think the Americans <laughs> have the stomach for. <laughs> okay, keep going, keep going. I don't think going. the Americans have the stomach for a real fight. The, the, they don't have the, the American administration doesn't inspire confidence. It doesn't have the stomach for a real fight. And as you're saying, the two sides are not going to see eye to eye. Uh, I actually don't think the biggest problem is between the Russians and the Americans. I think Iran is going to be the odd man out here. The Russians have indicated that they're not wed to Assad that some transition that maintains their interest is okay. The West is obviously supporting rebels that want to oust Assad. I think Iran, it comes down to Iran and Saudi influence. They're not going to agree on a transitional government. I don't see any easy way for them to agree. And so this is going to keep going. And the Americans, uh, the, the introduction suggested the Americans might be headed to a confrontation with Russia. I would be extremely surprised if this president is at all willing to be robust enough to stand up to, to Russian uh, ambitions or even presence in Syria. Uh, during the recent State of the Union address, he basically made the case that he wants America out of these complicated uh, quagmires in the Middle East. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, if I can go to Dan here, I wonder why the Americans go in there and start these own, their, their problems for themselves and everybody else on the ground. I mean, we go all across the entire region. Almost all of these wars are completely unnecessary, or as he used to President Obama's word, dumb wars, okay? But we'll just keep focused on Syria right here. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I think that, you know, it's, uh, Dan, again, what Pep, I agree with Pepe is that you won't hear a lot about this in Western media because Russia has actually stabilized the situation for the Damascus government, and they are making very slowly, but they are making gains here. And this is the real game changer here. It's not what terrorist group you want to rebrand, you know, color coat some kind of terrorist group and say these are actually good guys. That, we, that, cha that uh, train left the station a long time ago because the winners, uh, the, the people that are going to win this are creating facts on the ground as we speak. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And it's dividing. It is dividing the U.S. government. I mean, defeat breeds division. You alluded to this divide between um, Biden talking about military solution whilst Kerry is supposedly about to start uh, pushing for peace talks and so on. So defeat, defeat breeds division and, and, and defeat is exactly what's happening to U.S. policy in Syria. And so there are divides between those who want to try and salvage something at the negotiating table before all of their forces in the field get wiped out and those who want to uh, just push, step up military involvement and so on. on in, in reality, in fact, these two positions kind of work uh, tan in tandem and are working in tandem and work together because actually those pushing for the negotiations I don't think are genuinely serious, as I've said. I think they're trying to uh, go to the negotiations in order to try and buy some breathing space in order to reorganize their forces, get more unity between the various death squads that are e at each other's throats and so on. So. Uh, nevertheless, there are, there are divides in the U.S. administration, and this is a good thing because we want to see their strategy defeated. Okay, Pepe, also in the, in the uh, American inspired. Go, go ahead, jump in. Go ahead, jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask. I mean, we spoke about this last time Peter was on this show. Um, what is the end game here? Uh, obviously, we, there's no easy solution here. The Americans have stumbled from blunder to blunder. Nobody, I think, serious can question that this administration in the Middle East has made a lot of mistakes. But on the Russian side, they're coming in to defend their interests. They're coming in to protect Assad. That is not going to lead to a solution long term. The, the, the Sunni side that is fighting uh, Assad, the government supporting that side in the Middle East are not going to be happy with a, a continuation of what is in effect. The Iranian domination of that area. And now well, Iran's Iran about to be already had a lot this, of this influence there. I, I, this thing, I said it's a non starter. Iran already had influence. <laughs> Iran and Syria are very close allies. They have been for a very long time. No, it's American policy. But I mean, the if, you're, if you're anti Iranian, the if you're anti Iranian, okay, the best thing that ever happened to Iran was American foreign policy. It just empowers Iran left and right. Every single step the Americans take. It advances a totally different agenda. About what and is Syria the is at the very heart of it right now. Okay, Dan, you want to jump in in Oxford? Can I just say this? This, yeah, this. 
This Go idea ahead. about calling the, um, the Syrian rebels and death squads the Sunni side, I think is completely a uh, wrong way to characterize the conflict. It's, it's, it demeans both, both Sunnis and, and the, and, and the uh, Syrian government. The majority of Syrian Ab Arab army soldiers are Sunnis. Exactly. This idea that it, it's Sunni against Shia is actually is what's caused a lot of the it's, it's wrong-headed thinking in the West about I'm why this is going to be a quick game, why this is going to be a quick conflict. No, 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 gentlemen, if, if, gentlemen, don't talk if it over really each was, other. If this was really I, what I, it was Philippe, about, I gave you a chance. Please let Dan. Don't talk over him. Go ahead, Dan. But there's a delay. I'm if, sorry. There's a if delay. If this was really about Sunni versus Shia. Then, then the, uh, the, 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 the government would have collapsed a long time ago because the Alawites are a small minority, less than 10 percent. That's not what it's about. The, Syri the, the Sunni army, against the false projections of the West, actually stood uh, by its government and, and have continued to do so. Uh, uh, despite despite everything, so this characterization as a Sunni side is feeding into this sectarian sectarian narrative is very unhelpful there, and actually produces wrong-headed thinking. But there are real divisions. There are real divisions here. If I'm going to Pepe and, and Paris, the divisions are the United States, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. Those are the problems here. I mean, Assad, you know, he can go to the table or he might not go to the table. The Russians certainly would like him to do that. But all these other interests here, again, maybe all of us can agree that they, they, six months is what it's going to take for the Americans and that coalition to get. Their, uh, their, uh, their story straight, because they're certainly not now. Go ahead, Pepe, in Paris. Look, the most important thing, this is a proxy war. This is, this is way beyond Syria. This is about uh, the new Silk Roads in Eurasia, in fact. This is about Chinese and Russian influence and integration in the integration of Eurasia and how Syria is going to fit in. So if you go back, uh, well, only a few days ago, Xi Jinping's trip to yep. Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Egypt, he went there to sell the new Silk Roads, and the three of them bought them like crazy, especially the Saudis, because this could be a way out for them, a special relationship, a strategic relationship with China, which they already have with Iran, and they are already okay, uh, Pepe, doing it. Okay, Pepe, you have to jump in here. Syria Guys, we're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Syria. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the prospects for peace in Syria. Okay, I want to go back to the roving correspondent in Paris. Go ahead, Pepe, finish your point. Yes, uh, the point is uh, the most important thing about uh, this proxy war in Syria, this is a resource war. Okay, I'm going to try to, uh, an extremely complex uh, issue in two or three sentences. It's about basically two pipelines, and I've been writing about this for four years now. If we have the Turkey, Saudi, Qatari uh, connection winning in Syria, we're going to have a, a gas pipeline from Qatar to the Mediterranean, and Qatar is going to be providing the European Union in the future with lots of uh, liquefied natural gas. If we have a unified Syria victory, let's put it this way, with help from Iran and even help from Russia, which might seem contradictory, but it's not, we would have the Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline. And then Iran and Iraq would be providing liquefied natural gas to Europe in the long run, yep. even with help from uh, Russia, because Gazprom had already said on the record that they will be investing in this pipeline as well. So this is resource wars. This is the most important thing. All these uh, uh, Jaish al-Islam, okay, Arar al-Sham, Dash, Pepe, you know, but Pepe, Pepe, I think you would agree. On the but, this is but, just a detail. <laughs> okay, but, but uh, it, it is maybe just a detail, but there's going to be no pipelines if this war continues, okay? So let me go to Dan, okay, uh, about resolution here. One of thing course, I think that's really of important. Course. I was talking me, about the okay, long game. I yes. got it. Okay. D yes. Dan in Oxford here. It seems to me, uh, unless there's uh, someone in the, in the uh, in American administration wants to continue to um, put it, uh, everything into jeopardy, I do worry that there could be a possible U.S. Russia um, uh, conflict in Syria if it's not planned out, if it's not thought out well enough. But on the other hand here, and, and uh, Philippe uh, mentioned it in Tel Aviv here, we have two sets of outside. Here we have Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Russia. Now, this is somehow that's that the four powers that can actually end this. What's the combination where they all can sit down? Go ahead, because that's probably how it's going to work. Go ahead. 
Well, I, I mean, I, th I think it's important to understand, if we're talking about the possibility of, of, of U.S. and Russian war, it's important to understand that U.S. and Britain are already at war with Russia. It's not conventional yeah. war directly against Russia, but it's fought using terrorist proxies and it's fought uh, using economic uh, sabotage, the collapse of the oil price, the sanctions, the, uh, uh, the insinuations uh, about the death of Litvinenko being used as a means to strong arm Europe into stepping up and continuing and maintaining sanctions and so on. And Pepe is absolutely right that this is, this is to do with who gets to monopolize uh, gas supplies to Europe, will it be Qatar or Iran, those two, two, two pipelines, but it's much, but that in itself is just a, 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 a microcosm of the big picture yeah. in the world of the rise of the East, the rise of the BRICS and, and the decline of the West and the point is every, uh, every independent um, regional power sees that it makes more sense to uh, align themselves with the rising powers in, in, in the East rather than the war hungry maniacs uh, in the West and the West realizes this and it realizes actually I think that the age of the client state is coming to an end and that these powers if they are genuinely independent then they are not going to align themselves with the West there's no point they're in, it, they're in decline so they're so the West is actually seeking now to destabilize and destroy these states because it knows it cannot control them so when you say well there's, you know, there'll be no pipeline if, if, if the war continues. Well, that's uh, a good enough outcome from the point of view of the Western strategic exactly. planners because they know that an in genuinely independent Syria under whoever's control is not going to ally itself with Israel, with US, with Britain and so on. It's going to ally itself with the rising powers in the East. So that is really, that is kind of underlying this whole conflict and even underlying the pipeline wars as well, I think. Philippe, would you like to weigh in there? I think, you know, what Dan said is really interesting is that it really has, yes. I mean, from a Western perspective, it's all about Assad, you know, but, you know, if, if you step back, it's really all about sovereignty and who, uh, and who controls that sovereignty and how, how strong yeah. or how weak a state will be because a lot of these sta states in the region become w weaker because of this conflict here. I mean, this is a, ve a very important geopolitical issue to, uh, to be addressed. Go ahead, Philippe in Tel Aviv. Well, uh, with respect, I think the last analysis, not yours, the one previous to that uh, in London was a bit infantile with the conspiracy theorizing. But yes, there's a global or regional power cold war going on, not so cold anymore. Uh, and Russia and other countries are vying for influence. But again, I have to ask, what is the end game? Russia can be accused of many of the things that the West was accused of, rightfully. I think the West has completely for, for uh, example, blundered its way in the for, Middle East and, and, example, and made things worse. For example, so for example, for example, so for example, supporting war. All right. So uh, yes. What do you so mean supporting war? So Russia is now war? in Syria in, in earnest. Okay, okay, I'm going to have to well, teach I'm, you. I'm about to expi I'm well, going to no, explain no, no, but I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, your entire me, premise, I, I, your entire me, premise you is incorrect. Well, no, because you're going to chew up time on a false premise. Number one, the sovereign government I'm not in Damascus I, no, listen, invited Russia, Russia under anything. international law to protect its borders and to fight terrorism on its territory. That is a fact. Even what assuming I just that's said. true, and so that Assad the United is States even, and its allies, every single day violate the sovereignty of Syria without its permission. It supports terrorist groups in Syria to, uh, against the legitimate government in Damascus. I know you don't like Assad. I know you don't like the government in Damascus, but your entire premise is wrong. Do you okay? like Assad? It's indifferent if I like him or not. Do you like Assad? It's indifferent. It's, it's a wrong question to ask. But it's not ask. because I'm asking in, what the a, end game is. You know, I don't like Obama. So I don't gonna, like Obama, and I don't like the royal family of Saudi Assad? Arabia. The important okay, but I don't think the they should be overthrown. Like Please, I, I would, li I would like, you, you asked me a question. I would, like, I would like to be able to just make a comment about the question you asked Jump me. in. Okay? Jump in. The, the, the West is being accused of all, so the, so the West is being accused of all these excesses, Sometimes legitimately. I mean, a lot of what was said I agree with. But now Russia's in there trying to stabilize the country in yep. a way that is advantageous to it. But I don't see the end game. You're supporting a dictator that's not supported by, I believe, the majority of the population, if not a very substantial part of the population. 20 million refugees. But the Saudi elected. countries in the region will not accept him. The, the militant and Islamist fighters, and we, who was elected it, by his father, you know, I don't, the Islamist you know, I, fighters on frankly, the ground I could are not going to support this. What, what is Saudi the end game, Arabia Peter? What is the end game? About Syria. I could care less. They have done what more than any other country game, to what undermine that what country, is, break it up, create millions and millions of refugees. And you talk about a dictator? Come on. That's ridiculous. 
It's ridiculous. Assad who created the refugees. Assad no, created the refugees. No, it was the West backing the proxies that trying to destroy this state here. Go ahead, Dan. You, you were your that's analysis was simple, called infantile. Would you like what's to react to it? Let's, let's no, look at this. Don't game. chew up time. Go ahead, Dan and Oxford. Well, let's look at who, who created the refugees, who created the war. Assad came to power 2000. Was it 2005? Irrelevant. I believe his, his father was in power since, since 1970. When did the refugees start? Oh, 2011, when the war started. Who started the war? They were insertion of foreign fighters backed by the U.S. and Britain. That's when, the ref that's when the war started. That's when the refugees started. It's not the Assad regime that's concerned created out of nowhere. It's the proxy war that was initiated in 2011 by the West that created it. Okay. You want to react to that, Philip? That's a very good logical uh, timeline based gentlemen? on facts. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, so uh, obviously the proxy war contributed to it, but the atrocities committed by Assad are what fueled most of it. It doesn't matter in terms of the question you asked me. I want to know what is the end game? How does Russia believe peace will come by supporting Hezbollah? I have the and answer. Assad I have the, the answer. The I have the, the answer if you want to listen to it. Now I'm going to ask Pepe it? if he agrees or disagrees okay. with me because there is a military solution to this war, and it's Russia's helping, being the Air Force, to secure the sovereignty and the legitimacy of the Syrian state. Okay, and it's committed itself to doing just that. So and it wouldn't have intervened. Opposition. It wouldn't have intervened if it didn't think it could do it. Pepe, what do you think? Look, let's uh, go back to the motivations of all the the players on the ground. Let's start with Turkey. Turkey, they want to project influence uh, in uh, in the Arab world. So Syria will be perfect. It's contiguous. Uh, there is a Sunni business elite, but it's going down the drain because uh, Erdogan and Avutoglu they betted on uh, <laughs> Salafi yeah. jihadists to help yeah. their agenda. Absolutely stupid. And yeah. this is being contested by the best analytical minds in Turkey itself. And I am in touch with some of these people. Saudi Arabia, they would like to have some sort of a soft caliphate in Syria uh, under the orbit of Saudi business. It's not li like they would have with uh, the Hariri gang in Lebanon. They did have for a while. It's not going to happen. Iran, of course. Iran, because Iran, is, there is uh, what is called... Uh, by many people in, in Iran and also around the Arab street, the axis of resistance, which is Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah. And obviously, it's against uh, especially U.S. and Israeli interests and uh, Israeli projection of power or divide and rule power in the region. Uh, they are gaining ground for the past three months. This, is not, this doesn't mean anything in the long run. And there are differences in terms of what Iran wants in the long run for Syria and what Russia wants. Uh, the Russian preoccupation, first of all, it's about national sovereignty. And this was the number one yeah. reason for Putin to intervene in Syria. He didn't want another Libya. Yep. And he knew exactly what would happen because uh, Medvedev was responsible for uh, that vote in the UN Security Council that later uh, entailed the disintegration of Libya by NATO. So Putin didn't want a, a remix of this situation. And then we have the GCC countries, especially Qatar in been? this case. Uh, they basically want their pipeline and they want to do business with Europe. And they cannot export their liquefied natural gas if there is no, no pipeline. So uh, the motivations of all the players are... They're practically, uh, I, I would say, irreconcilable. What, what we're going to have in Geneva is all the players will be trying to gain some ground. So when we hear uh, the Erdogan gang and Joe Biden at the same time talking about a U.S. military inter boots, on, boots on the ground, it will be to help their proxies on the ground already or people they're doing business with, which is Jaish al-Islam and Arar al-Sham. On the other hand, we still have the loose cannon in the whole thing, which is Dash. We don't know what Dash Good is going point. to do now that they are practically encircled. They Man cannot get sir? supplies from anywhere, even from the Turkish border, if the, yep. if the Syrian Kurds get there. It would be absolutely impossible. So I, would, I could even bet on a Lebanon-style 15-year-long civil war going on, proxy war going on, in fact. Oh my Geneva goodness. or not Geneva. Okay, on a very depressing note, we have ended, but it was a very good discussion as well. Many thanks to my guests in Paris, Oxford, and in Tel Aviv. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Cross Talk Rules.